Well, thank you for having me. I'm really glad to be here. I'm really glad uh, to still have the opportunity to present at conferences despite this pandemic. I hope uh, everybody's doing well. Uh, for those who don't know me, uh, as Ian said, I'm Bryce adelson Malbach. Uh, I work at NVIDIA, um, where I am the HPC programming models architect. So I work on various different programming languages like C++ and Fortran, and also um, various different runtime systems or parallel programming paradigms, things like OpenACC, OpenMP, um, stuff like that. Um, and the one that I've been particularly heavily involved in, heavily involved in, is uh, uh, parallelism in standard C++. I am the chair of the C++ committee's uh, library evolution uh, group, which is responsible for the uh, design of the C++ standard library. And I'm also the chair of the uh, US standards committee for programming languages. So today I'm gonna to talk about a project my team's been working on for a couple of years now called the uh, CUDA C++ standard library or libq++. Um, but before we talk about that project, um, let me first go over what CUDA C++ is. Um, some people who are watching this may not be familiar, but don't worry, even if you've never used CUDA C++ or you don't particularly care to, I think this will still be an interesting talk to you. So um, one of my colleagues wrote this uh, a great quote, which I think really captures the, the essence of what CUDA C++ is. Um, CUDA C++ is an extension of C++ that uh, NVIDIA um, uses as the, uh, the primary language to program our GPUs in, or to write heterogeneous programs where you have code that runs on uh, the CPU, and then some of that code also runs on your GPU. Um, so we like to think of uh, CUDA C++ as being a superset of standard C++. In your host code, you can do everything that you can in standard C++. Um, and in fact, today you can use uh, uh, whichever host compiler you want. So you can write your host code um, you know, with GCC. Um, but also in that same program, you can have code that can run on the device. Um, and there is uh, not everything, not all types of code will run on the device today, although we're, we're working to minimize that gap. And there are some uh, restrictions on what things you can pass between host and device code. Uh, for example, if you have a function that is a heterogeneous function, so a function that you intended to compile for both the host processor and the device processor. Um, you can't pass a function pointer to that function between the host processor and the device processor because the addresses of those compiled functions are different for the host version and the device version. So there's some restrictions like that uh, that's worth knowing about. Um, but for the most part, you can just write regular C++ and have it run on your GPU. So if we look at what makes C++ what it is, um, if you look at the standard itself, about I think 700 of the 2200 pages cover the core language and the rest of the standard covers the standard library. Um, it, it, the standard library is uh, an equally important component of the language as the core uh, language itself. Uh, C++ without a standard library is a completely different language, a very severely diminished language. So when we look at CUDA C++, we've had a core language, um, but until recently, we have not had an equivalent of the standard library. You have not been able to use your host's um, uh, standard library in uh, CUDA code. That's been one of the restrictions. Um, and that has left the experience a little bit lacking until now, um, until the arrival of the CUDA C++ standard library, which we call libq++. Um, it is an open source project. It's uh, a fork of, well, um, it's a derivative of, I don't say, uh, fork suggests that perhaps it diverges from upstream, but it, it doesn't. 
Um, it's a fork of uh, libq plus plus of libc plus plus, the LLVM uh, standard library. Um, and it has three sort of key properties that I want to talk about, which is that it's opt-in, it's heterogeneous, and it's incremental. So it's opt-in, which means that it does not interfere with or replace your host standard library when you use it with NVCC, our, um, our primary compiler. So uh, if you include, you know, some header like uh, type traits and you use stuff in std colon colon, that's the stuff that you, that's from your host standard library. Um, and it's strictly conforming to standard C++. Um, but you can only use those facilities in host code. Um, if you include the same header um, in CUDA slash std, um, you'll get the version that will uh, work in both host code and device code. And it'll be in the namespace CUDA colon colon std colon colon. Um, and then uh, there's a third namespace, which is just the, the raw CUDA colon colon namespace. And in that namespace, we have some uh, direct extensions of some things that are in the standard that are uh, conforming extensions to uh, various uh, standard facilities. So for example, you know, uh, for Atomic, um, if you just use std Atomic, that's your host Atomic, you can just use that um, uh, only in host code. CUDA std Atomic, you could use in both host code or in device code. And then CUDA Atomic itself, is a uh, extended form that has this additional template parameter, but otherwise operates just like a CUDA atomic. And we have a few other extensions of the sort of a similar nature to that. So libq++ is also heterogeneous. Um, uh, and our intent there is for essentially all things in libq++ to not only work in host code and not only work in device code, but also to work across host and device code so that you can move them between host and device code so that both host threads and device threads can access them at the same time. So we try to make the guarantee that all copyable and movable objects can migrate between host and device code, uh, that host and device can call all member functions, um, and that the host and device can concurrently use synchronization primitives, um, although there's some uh, uh, caveats around that. And libq++ is also incremental, which is uh, just a, a fancy way of me saying that it, it doesn't have everything that's in the standard library today. Um, each release, we add a bunch of new stuff. Um, our focus is on uh, two different categories of things. First, facilities that need a specialized CUDA implementation. Um, so things like concurrency primitives, clocks, syscalls, IO, et cetera. And the second category is essential facilities that aren't that hard to implement in device code, but um, they're so commonly used that everybody ends up spending time re-implementing them. So it's, it's high value for us to provide a version so that people can stop doing that. So uh, in uh, libq++ today, um, uh, we primarily have a collection of uh, concurrency uh, facilities. Um, and we're looking at expanding that um, in the next few releases. And then we'll probably move on to some other things like string processing and some more, um, so some of the simpler container types like array. Um, and IO is also on our like longer term roadmap. People want std C out to just work on the GPU. Um, so today I'm going to focus on uh, sort of the marquee feature of libq++, which uh, is uh, Atomics. That was the, the first major feature that we had. Um, and it's one of the most uh, important features in libq++ uh, because it directly exposes um, uh, some of the uh, exciting capabilities of our hardware. So this is what... Uh, uh, the Atomics API in libq++ looks like. So we uh, we have two versions of Atomic in libq++. Um, the first is uh, CUDA colon colon Atomic, which is this um, extended version of the standard Atomic. So it, uh, it takes two template parameters, the standard one of just what the element type is. And then it takes this uh, scope um, parameter, this thread scope parameter. Um, and a thread scope specifies which threads 
um, can safely use an atomic object at the same time. So thread scope system means all threads. That is the equivalent of the semantics of stood atomic. Stood atomic doesn't have any restrictions on what kinds of threads can use it. Thread scope device um, means that all threads on the current processor can use it. So uh, a thread scope device, atomic and device code can only be used by other threads on that device. Um, a, thread scope atom a thread scope device in uh, uh, host code can only be used by uh, CPU threads. And then thread scope block um, is sort of specific to um, uh, CUDA. There's this notion of thread blocks in the CUDA programming model. And an atomic with a thread scope block is, can only be used by threads within that uh, thread block. And so then we also have um, our CUDA stood atomic, which is uh, a, an implementation of the standard and strictly conforms to ISO IEC international standard 14882. Um, and it's equivalent to a CUDA atomic with a thread scope system. Um, it's actually just like a type alias in our code base. So next, I want to look at some examples of how you would write atomic code in CUDA before libq++. And while these examples are going to be specific to CUDA, the lessons um, are applicable to many of the other pre-C++11 non-standard atomics uh, APIs, like GCC atomics or atomics on uh, Windows. And we'll, we'll see through this uh, exercise why C++11 atomics are a much better abstraction and a much less error-prone abstraction. So uh, before libq++, you might try to write a uh, CUDA signal flag function like this, where you use volatile variables to signal uh, that a flag is set atomically. Uh, so you just, you know, this function just takes in a, this um, flag parameter and then it just does a volatile right to it. This isn't actually uh, sufficient though, because volatile does not actually guarantee atomic semantics. It doesn't um, make the guarantees about memory ordering uh, that uh, you might uh, incorrectly uh, assume that it does. Um, volatile is not safe for interthread communication. That's not what its intended purpose is. And it might happen to work on some systems, like this happened to work in legacy CUDA, um, but that doesn't mean that it's a good idea because it means that code um, is probably not going to be super portable, not only to other platforms, but it might not be portable to future iterations of the system that no longer make uh, make it just magically happen to work because that those semantics aren't guaranteed. You can't really rely on them. You're relying on undefined behavior here, and that's never a good idea in general. It's in particular a dangerous idea when you're dealing with concurrent code. So again, volatile is not equal to a top. So. Um, to make this code a little bit more correct, we need to put in uh, some sort of fence operation. Uh, if we put in something like a, uh, a thread fence system here, um, uh, then this code uh, is a little bit cro closer to being uh, notionally correct. Um, but it's a little bit unfortunate that in a lot of these legacy atomic um, APIs like legacy CUDA atomics or GCC atomics, the fence operations um, had to be explicit. The fence operations were not fused with the operation that you wanted to fence. So like the operation that we want to fence here is the assignment of one to that flag. Um, and what we would really like is an API where that assignment operation itself will take care of doing the fence. So what we really want here is an atomic with store release semantics, not a volatile store. Now, unfortunately, uh, CUDA does have in its legacy atomics, you know, some atomic functions, it's not all just volatiles, but there's no atomic store function and no atomic load function. And this is a pretty common pattern uh, across um, uh, these legacy APIs where they don't have an explicit atomic store and atomic load. 
Um, it, it, those were emitted because of this reliance on, you know, explicit fencing and, uh, and some, on some platforms on uh, volatile um, providing the certain semantic guarantees, but not portably, of course. So um, we have no atomic store. There's some other similar operations that we could use to sort of uh, uh, mimic its effect. Like we could do atomic exchange and just ignore the result. Um, but that's not really like what we intended to do. So it's a little bit kludgy here. We, we still can't get rid of the fence that we had to put in though, because um, all of the CUDA legacy atomics uh, have relaxed semantics. And again, this is very common across um, these pre-C++11 atomic interfaces. So as I said, we wanted store release semantics, which means we still need to keep this fence uh, in here. So here's what this code looks like if you're using C++11 atomics like libq++. We have an atomic uh, bool flag, not a volatile int. Um, and uh, we just write, uh, we just assign true to the flag and that's all. And this takes care of the fence, does everything that we want it to. And one of the subtle improvements here is that we were able to write atomic bool instead of using ints. Um, for a flag, bool was probably our intent. The reason you often see a lot of um, uh, ints used instead of a more appropriate type in uh, older pre-C++11 atomic interfaces is that a lot of those interfaces only supported one or two sizes. Typically, they'd support you know 32-bit operations and 64-bit operations. Um, now, uh, your platform might not natively have one byte atomic operations, but atomic bool will still work which is nice. So on the previous slide, we just assigned true to the atomic um, and that works, but that will use the strongest memory ordering in the C++ model, which is sequential consistency. And that's actually a bit stronger than what we need. Now it's a good default and it is the default for all of the overloaded operators like the assignment operator. Um, uh, but here, if we wanna be a little bit more efficient, um, we might want to, instead of using the assignment operator, call the store member function, which takes a um, memory order parameter. And we can just say, hey, I want to do this store with memory order release semantics. Now, there's an even better form that we can write uh, with C20's new atomic wait and notify API. Um, uh, this is available in libq, and we've backported it. Um, to uh, C++11. Uh, and we also contributed the patch upstream to libc++ um, for this facility. So after we do our uh, store release uh, to the flag, um, we'll call this um, notify all API on the flag to wake up anybody that was waiting for the value of the atomic to change. And when we look at the consumption side, we'll see um, where this comes into, uh, uh, where this factors in. All right, so now let's look at the consumer side of this example. So a function that pulls on a flag and then reads some int data um, that the producer wrote uh, before it's signaled. So we have the same issues with this uh, example uh, that we had with Volatile in the previous example, that it, it, it does not actually give us um, atomic semantics. It might happen to work on some platforms, but it's not portable and, and it's all just undefined behavior. So in the code here, we've just got a, a while loop where we're just polling until that flag is, no, is uh, uh, equal to one, and then we just exit out of the loop and then we uh, uh, read the data. Um, and uh, that loop is a little bit um, suboptimal because it's really just a naive spin loop. Under contention, it's going to perform pretty badly. You know, imagine if you have tens or hundreds or thousands of, of threads, all of which are every cycle trying to um, read this one flag, uh, waiting for it to be set from zero to one. Um, well, they're all going to be um, pounding uh, the cache and memory uh, trying to access that one location. 
Uh, and, and the read that we're doing here is a volatile read, so it's a, it's a fairly expensive read. We don't want or need to read the data um, either atomically or volatile with volatile loads. Um, the read of the flag should ensure that we can safely and non-atomically read the data because reading the flag should establish a memory ordering that once we read that flag, um, we, we, we should have established a uh, release acquire memory ordering where we know, hey, because we've seen this flag write, we know that any writes that happened before the flag was written are now visible to us. So on the, on the producer side, the producer would first write to data, and then after it's written to data, it would write to the flag with those store release semantics, and it would have the guarantee that any thread that sees the flag has been set to one will also see the write of the data. So there's no need for us to actually read the data as volatile. But if we just remove the volatile read, um, we're gonna have a bug in the code because um, this uh, uh, volatile read of the flag that we have doesn't give us that memory ordering because again, volatile does not uh, give us uh, atomic semantics. So we haven't established the memory ordering on this side of the operation yet. So we could do that in legacy APIs by explicitly adding a fence, but very often um, you'll end up forgetting to do that. Again, it would be very nice if that fence operation, which we need uh, for correctness, was fused onto the read operation, the operation where we read the flag in the while loop. So instead of doing a volatile load of the flag, what we should really be doing is an atomic load acquire. Uh, the CUDA legacy atomics API doesn't have an atomic load, just like it didn't have an atomic store. Um, but there's like a little hack that you can do, which is you could use an atomic add where you add zero. Um, but like that's a little bit un unpleasant and it just makes for terrible code clarity. Um, now, even if we switch to the, this atomics API and get rid of the volatile, we still need um, the fence here. And the reason that we still need that fence is because all of the legacy atomic uh, functions in CUDA, like atomic add, they, they just give you a relaxed memory ordering, the weakest memory ordering. And what we need here is an acquire ordering. We need that promise that once we read that flag as one, that we know that the data write that happened from the producer that, that we'll actually see it. So with uh, C++11 atomics, this code becomes much cleaner and more correct. Um, we change that flag from being an int to be an atomic pool. Um, and uh, uh, that makes this very nice and clean. We've still, however, got this uh, spin loop uh, that's gonna be bad under contention. And that's where this new C++20 wait notify API comes in. Um, ah, but first, uh, we don't actually need the sequential consistency here. Um, a load acquire is sufficient and it's gonna be more performant. Now in, in that previous slide, uh, we were just relying on a, a, the atomics implicit conversion to T, which loads the value using sequential consistency uh, semantics. Now, if we want to specify um, uh, weaker semantics, we need to use the load API and say we want to load with memory order acquire. All right, so now let's deal with that spin loop. So instead of using this spin loop, we can use this new C++20 wait notify API. Um, and what this wait API does is it says, hey, I would like to wait until the, this value changes from what, it, what I believe it currently is to something else. So it wait says, I, tell me like, exit this wait once this value is no longer equal to the value I've just given you. In this case, false. So this wait false memory order require says, I want you to read this thing with memory order require semantics. And when it's no longer false, I want you to return. So the particular waiting mechanism that's gonna be used is left up to the implementation. 
Um, on a CPU, you might use an operating system primitive for efficient weighting, um, such as a Futex, which is not just going to be in a spin loop um, constantly uh, uh, hitting that variable. It's going to use this um, more clever and efficient uh, and fair operating system mechanism that will scale well under contention. Uh, in our uh, GPU side implementation, we use a back off mechanism that will um, sleep the waiting thread for short durations after every failed read. So it'll go and read the value, it'll check if it's changed from what it was supposed to be, and uh, if it uh, hasn't changed, then it'll just tell the, the thread, hey, just go to sleep for a little while, just go and like wait and then come back later. It's Sort of similar to if you're um, if you're at a theme park and there's a really long uh, line for a ride, you might just say, you know what, I'm just going to go do something else and I'll come back to this line later and maybe it'll be uh, shorter then and then I won't, you know, contribute to that line being really long and I won't have to wait in that line uh, forever. I can go do some other thing. So C++ Atomics also give you a greater deal of type safety than you'd get with um, older Atomic APIs uh, that did not uh, uh, denote atomicity in the type system. Uh, for example, if you mix the thread scopes of your Atomics, libq++ will catch that at compile time and will give you an error. So if you try to call a function that expects an atomic with a thread scope uh, system, you try to call that with an atomic that has a uh, thread scope device, that will give you a compile error. Whereas in uh, the legacy CUDA atomics, um, uh, there is no such type information. Uh, and so that bug would just be a silent uh, uh, possible data race at runtime. Uh, the legacy CUDA Atomics also um, made it somewhat challenging to write code that was not just device code, but, but also host code that was truly heterogeneous code that could run everywhere because all of the legacy CUDA Atomics only work in device code. Um, so you'd have to go and write your function one way using the CUDA legacy Atomics, and then you have to write it another way um, uh, for you know, your host platform. Um, whereas with libq++, um, all of the atomics work in both host and device code. So you can just write your code in one way. So the moral of the story here is uh, you should stop using legacy CUDA atomics and you should stop using any uh, legacy atomic API, any atomic API that's not C++11 atomics um, or, or C11 um, atomics. Um, in a lot of these legacy APIs, you don't have a way to express sequential consistency and acquire release as um, sort of uh, top level citizens. Um, you have to build them yourself with fences. Um, uh, the legacy CUDA atomics, as you mentioned, they're device only. Um, the memory scope is a property of operations, not objects, which gives you um, a lot of potential for um, uh, errors. And atomicity itself is a property of operations, not objects, again, which uh, uh, leaves you a lot of room for making mistakes, accidentally passing something that is not actually intended to be accessed atomically into an API that's going to try to access it atomically. Uh, and also, uh, please, please stop using volatile uh, to attempt to synchronize between threads because it does not work. That's not what it's for. Volatile is not uh, mean atomic. Uh, on some platforms, volatile had been a vague pact, um, but that's not something that you can rely on. It's not something that's portable. It's not something that the standard guarantees. You should instead use uh, C++ atomics, which have clear semantics. Okay, so now I want to talk about why all of this matters. Um, you know, we our team spent a lot of work um, exposing uh, C++ uh, atomics. Um, and when I say our team here, I don't just mean our software team. I mean our hardware team uh, spent a lot of effort on this too. Um, we we spent a lot of transistors making sure that our modern GPUs um, 
conform to C++ parallel forward progress guarantees and to the C++ memory model. It was a lot of work. It was like a 10 year project. So why did we do this? Why is that this so important? Why does it matter? Well, when you have these two things, when you have C++ parallel forward progress guarantees and uh, conforming implementation of the C++ memory model, um, that enables you to write a much wider range of concurrent algorithms and data structures um, on GPUs, um, particularly blocking uh, algorithms. Um, so this is sort of a, a taxonomy of the different uh, types of concurrent algorithms. And you don't have to necessarily understand all the terms that are on this chart. The key thing to understand is this. Um, on platforms that only ensure that threads make weak parallel forward progress, um, that would be pretty much all GPUs that uh, are not made by NVIDIA and all NVIDIA GPUs before the Volta generation. Um, they only provided weekly parallel forward progress guarantees. Um, and such platform, so the, this, this greatly restricts the type of concurrent code that you can write. Um, uh, for example, the simple signaling and polling functions that we looked at before, you can't actually write those on these platforms because they use blocking on the, uh, on the uh, poll then read side. What were we doing? We were in that spin loop. Well, that's a form of blocking. So the, the ways that you have to write concurrent code on these platforms that don't provide parallel forward progress guarantees, it's, it's very restricted. Now, with uh, Volta and newer NVIDIA GPUs, because you have these parallel forward progress guarantees and C++ Tomics, uh, you can write any type of concurrent algorithm or data structure on, these, uh, on, on our platforms. Um, and that means that you can run more types of applications and more types of code on GPUs. And we think that's really important. So now I want to look at a, a slightly more advanced uh, example, um, which is going to be building a, a concurrent GPU hash table uh, with uh, Atomics. So we're going to use open addressing and linear probing, both for simplicity and uh, performance. And uh, this concurrent hash table, it's sort of, it's, it's not really a hash map. Um, it's sort of like a hash array because we're not going to make it something that can be grown in size. Um, so it'll have an initial capacity. And once that capacity is full, it'll be, it'll be done. So um, the number, yeah, the number of the slots in the map are going to be fixed. Um, uh, and uh, we're going to store the keys in uh, this one array. So we're, so the keys and the values will be stored in two separate arrays, not right. Each key value pair will not be, uh, uh, consecutive um, in memory. They'll instead be disjoint. And then the values are going to be stored in this second array here. And then we're going to have one more array that'll be the, the size of the other two, which will be um, uh, a uh, state um, for each one of the slots in the map. Um, and so that's going to be an atomic of this state type, which is just this um, enumerator. And there's three states for each different slot. Um, uh, the, the states are going to be, it'll go from empty to reserved and then to filled. No other transitions are allowed. So we're only going to support uh, insertion into this data structure. We're not going to um, uh, deal with uh, removal of elements. So once something's been inserted, there's no way to um, take it out. Um, we have a, uh, some function objects for uh, hashing the keys and then uh, comparing the keys for equality. And uh, that's it. And then we've got this uh, try insert um, uh, function, uh, which does the actual concurrent insertion. So um, let's look at uh, a little diagram of how this is going to work. So uh, we're going to start up here at the... Uh, at the top at try to set slot to reserve. So that's the first thing we're gonna do when we're trying to, in, to insert is we're gonna go and find the slot that we want to, uh, th that's, that's the candidate for this insertion um, using uh, linear probing. 
and then we'll try to set that slot to reserved. Now, if uh, we succeed in setting the slot to reserved, that means that we are going to be the one that's going to get to set this slot. We've claimed this slot. Essentially, we've sort of locked this slot. So then the next thing we'll do is we will uh, fill the slot with the key and value that we need to insert. And then once that's done, we will set the slot to filled. And setting the slot to filled tells everybody else, hey, this slot can now be read. And then uh, the insertion has uh, succeeded. Now, um, suppose that uh, we are trying to set the slot to reserved and we find that the slot um, is already reserved. Um, okay, well, so now what we need to do is we need to wait until the slot becomes uh, filled. Um, and we'll see why in a minute. So now let's go to the case um, of we tried to set the slot to reserved and the slot uh, was, was filled. So if the slot was filled, now we need to check to see if the key in the slot is equal to our key. It's possible that it's not. It's possible that this was just like a hash collision. Um, but it might have been that this element was already inserted in, into the table. So if they are equal, then the insertion failed and we just return and say, hey, this, this key's already been inserted. If they're not equal, um, then we're going to go and find the next candidate slot, again, using linear probing, and then we'll repeat the whole process um, uh, again until we eventually either succeed or fail. All right, so now let's walk through the code of how we do this. So the first thing that we do um, in try insert is uh, we compute the first slot that we should attempt to put the specified key in. And we do this by hashing the key and moduloing the result with the capacity of the map. So next, we're going to enter this loop where we iteratively try to insert the key into the slot. And if that fails, we pick another slot and try again. And we will, um, uh, if we fail to find any slots after we've made a number of temp attempts equal to the size of the container, then we give up because we've tried to insert into every slot in the map and we failed, which means that the map is full. So now let's look at this probing loop. So the first thing we do inside of this loop um, is we atomically load the state of the slot that we're probing with memory order acquired semantics. If that state is empty, then we are going to try to attempt to set that state to reserved, to lock it, to claim it for ourselves. So to lock a slot, uh, we, we need to set a state to reserved, and uh, we'll do that with just a compare and exchange. So if the compare exchange succeeds, then we've set the state to reserved, and we've acquired that slot. Now we own it, and now we are going to succeed, so all we have to do is insert the key and value. And um, after we've inserted the key and value, now we need to let everybody else know that uh, uh, the slot has been filled and that they can now go and read it or that they can check whether their key matches the key that they're trying to insert. Um, so, we use memory order release here, which is important because we want to establish this memory ordering here. We want to make sure that when any other thread, after if any other thread reads that the state of this slot is filled, that they can also read the key and the value and they'll get the key and the value that we wrote before this store. And that's what memory order release does. Memory order release says, hey, make sure that anybody who sees this write will also see any of the other writes, atomic or non-atomic, that happened before this atomic write. <laughs> my apologies, I just dropped my phone. Um, all right. So finally, we need to wake up any of the threads that may have been waiting on this slot. And we're going to do this with notify all. So that's, the again, this new C++20 um, uh, wait, notify API. So here we're just saying, hey, anybody that was snoozing, waiting for us to make this thing filled, now you can wake up. 
Okay, and then we're done. So we're gonna return a pointer to the inserted value to say, hey, here's the node that we successfully inserted. Okay, so now let's go to the case where we failed to set the slot to reserved, but we've observed that the state of the slot um, uh, is reserved. And that means that another thread has acquired this slot and we need to wait for that other thread to fill it before we proceed. So we'll know that the slot is filled when the slot's state um, is no longer reserved. Again, in this simple example, there's only the three states. There's empty, reserved, and filled. And uh, you're only allowed to go from empty to reserved and from reserved to filled. So if we just wait um, until, like if we see that it's reserved, we know that it's never going to go back to being empty. We can just wait until it's no longer reserved. Um, and then we'll know that it has become filled. So we could do this with just this, you know, simple naive spin loop here. But again, we want to avoid those types of spin loops because they're not particularly efficient. So instead, we can use a wait here. And, and what this wait says essentially is wait until this atomic is no longer equal to this value. And we know because of the invariance of this data structure that when this state of this is no longer equal to reserved, that it will then be filled. Okay, so now after that wait, we know that the slot has been filled by another thread. Um, and so now we need to check whether the key that was filled is the same as our key. It's possible again that it's not, in which case it's a collision and we just move on to the next candidate slot. If it is the same key, then the insertion failed and we just return the value that the other thread inserted. So, so if the key wasn't equal, then we need to move on to the next slot and try all of this again. And so we just, uh, in, because we're doing linear probing, we just say, okay, we're just gonna try the next index um, modulo the capacity. And that's it. This is a um, pretty efficient uh, GPU implementation of con concurrent insertion into a ha hash map. Um, I, I don't need to show you the algorithm for lookup. It uses the same basic principles here. Um, and there's a couple different variations of this type of data structure. Um, there's different things that you need to do if you want to be able to support removals. Um, but uh, this is something that will scale to um, tens or hundreds of thousands of threads on uh, your GPU, and it fits nicely on one slide. So uh, the sort of the moral of the story here is that there's this whole new world of algorithms and data structures uh, that uh, can be accelerated on modern NVIDIA GPUs because now we have um, uh, C++ parallel forward progress guarantees and uh, uh, C++ atomics, which lets us write any class of concurrent algorithm, including blocking algorithms. So it greatly expands the type of uh, uh, code that you can write on GPUs. Okay, so that's um, that's pretty much it. Um, so as I mentioned before, libq++ um, is an open source project. You can go find it on GitHub. It's also included um, in the CUDA toolkit. Um, it's been there since uh, 10.2. Um, and we're constantly uh, working on adding new uh, features. We just put out a release a few weeks ago. Um, so be sure to check it out.